am so excited because this is the very last week of the Your Invited series. How many have been here for all four weeks? Will you please raise your hand? The Gold Star students, yeah, the extra credit students. Oh, I see you. Yes, yes, brother. Okay, those are the ones that are going to get preferred parking next Sunday, okay? Start motivating y'all to show up on time right here. You know where God's anointing is? Right here in the front row, okay? I swear to you, you'll lose five pounds by the end of service. No, just kidding. Half kidding. Okay, great. You know what I love, though, in the You're Invited series? We are starting this church with the firm foundation, and that foundation is the love of Jesus Christ. You know what I love about Jesus, and we're going through the Gospels, that it's not just knowing Jesus for loving the lost, but this is the Jesus that we get to discover as living life with the lost. If you were with us last week, how many of us here with us last week? Yes. Okay, so we see in the pages of Scripture that there's this man, a demon-possessed man, a demoniac man. He was kind of like a modern-day tweaker, and he's hearing voices, and he's shouting after Jesus, Jesus, Son of David. And then he comes into his right mind in the presence of Jesus, and he becomes the first Gentile missionary, not to one city, but to ten cities, which was Decapolis. Tell me my God won't do it. You can come in one day hearing voices and walk out hearing the one voice of God. Amen. And then two weeks ago, Pastor Matt, my handsome husband, he taught on a a brother that we know as Peter. Peter was a disciple of Jesus Christ. But see, Peter was a fisherman before he became a fisher of men. Okay, and I need us to go into the pages of Scripture and start getting visuals of who these people were. See, Peter was a shoreside man with a shoreside accent, tanned, leathered skin, tattered seaside clothes. You know, he probably was like Paulie D from Jersey Shore. And so when Jesus asked him, Pete, will you roll with me? Will you be a fisher of men? Peter was like, yeah, buddy, gym tan laundry, be right up with you, Jesus. And he cuts off the year of Malchus. I mean, this guy is crazy. And he had an encounter with Jesus. And then in week one, we spoke about the Samaritan woman. She was like the New Testament version. Oh, you know, Cardi B, because she's a little crazy. Oh, grrr. yes, this is the woman that we see here. As we end out this series, I want to talk about Jesus' dinner party ministry. We really don't get to talk a whole lot about that, but tonight I want to go through this because around the table that Jesus set, he didn't care who he was with. Prostitutes, tax collectors, women, men, young, old, white, black, Asian, Haitian, Eurasian, Eurasian, like he's all there and he is excited to be with God's people. He loved talking about banquets and dinner parties. And if you didn't follow the ministry of Jesus, even if you sat with him and you were too dense or dumb to recognize how much you loved dinner parties, he even told stories about it called parables. And this is where we're going to camp out tonight. The trailer before service started is this parable that we're going to go through tonight. So open up your Bibles, get your Bibles. Let me see you moving your hands. If you were here last week, you know I gave a little pow pow for those that didn't bring their Bible to the house of God, okay? You don't go to Kim's cast without your chemistry book. You don't go to the market without your wallet. You don't get into your car without your keys, and you don't come to church without your Bible. All right, and if you don't have one, we have a gift for you afterwards. You can pick up that Bible. Turn with me. You guys, that was funny, okay? <laughs> Luke chapter 14, you're like, is she mad? No, this is how I talk, okay? This is me being loving. Luke chapter 14, starting with verse 16. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet. A certain man was throwing a great party and invited many guests. At that time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. If you know me, I love dinner parties. I love welcoming people into my home. I love serving people. I'm a seven on Enneagram, so I love a good turn up, okay? But also, I was raised in a family of seven. We're Hispanic, and you know Hispanic people roll deep with all their kids. And I lived in a small three-bedroom house at 830 Meeker Street, and every night we would clamor around the dining room table and fight to see where we were gonna sit. See, the problem was that there were seven of us, but our table only sat six. So inevitably, one person had to sit the corner of the table in the worst position possible. This person didn't even have a regular seat. It was like a low, like ottoman, like a foot cushion, and we referred to it lovingly as the nub. No one wanted to sit on the nub. You had to sit below the rest of the table. You actually had to stand up if you wanted to grab your food. If you wanted sloppy seconds, good luck with that one because you're at the nub, right? No one wanted to be there. 
The question I always wrestled with, it was doing homework or playing outside with my friends. And in the sunset, I would ask myself, will I have a seat at the table? Will I have a seat at the table? Man, I would later on recognize that this question of will I have a seat at the table or do I have a seat at the table is one that I would ask proverbially through the rest of my life. As a kid, I grew up and I shopped at thrift stores and bargain bins. Not because we were hipsters living in Costa Mesa, we were brokesters, okay? <laughs> like we were so poor, we couldn't afford the OR, we just po, okay, that's how po we were. So I asked the question, would I sit at the cool kids table? As a brown girl from the hood who couldn't read, write, or spell at the age of 12, I asked, would I have a seat at the academic table? My dad is an immigrant to this country with a thick accent and dark skin. Would I fit in at the American table? I was obese at the age of 11. I weighed more than my father. Would I even fit at the table? As I, that was also funny. You can laugh at that, okay? <laughs> Like, do we laugh? Yes, we do. We can have fun in the house of God. If you're sitting here and you're bored, it's because you're boring, okay? As I got older, I began to incessantly fight against the lie that I would never have a seat at the table. I thought to be successful and to be a leader and to be American, I had to be perfect and polished and pretty, and my thighs could never touch. This was what I thought. And so going through high school, I excelled. I played varsity sports, I was captain of two varsity sports, I was class president, I was Bible club vice president, I became school president, I was gonna excel. I went on to college, and in college I had a stellar GPA, I was actually a Bill Gates Millennium Scholar, and then went on to graduate school, and graduated graduate school with a 4.0, because I was gonna prove to the world and the statisticians who put me in the category highest prone to failure, that I was gonna sit at that table. The problem with that equation, is that it was me trying to nuzzle and fight and shoulder my way in without recognizing that there is a God who is in control over all. I thought that I can earn my position. I thought that maybe with enough charm and charisma and dedication and blood, sweat, and tears that I would get there. But that all changed when I started serving in ministry. For the first time in my life, I was told I didn't have a seat at the table. I wasn't even allowed to sit at the corner on a nub I wasn't allowed to be at the table. I remember wanting to get my graduate degree in theology and I didn't think that it was gonna be a problem to get in because I'd done so well in undergrad and my GPA was great and my letters of recommendation were great and so imagine my shock when I received a rejection letter from the school and I was, I was confused. So I called the school and was connected to the dean and the dean explained to me that I was indeed rejected from the school and I said, but, but I don't understand why. And he said, well, there's certain coursework that you need to take in order to get admission into the program. But then I explained, but those courses are only open to men. And he said, then you're not allowed into the program. Essentially, there was no room for me at the table. For the first time in a really long time, I couldn't work harder, I couldn't be smarter, I couldn't be lighter, I couldn't be faster, I couldn't be talented enough. I remember being flashed back to this moment. As I'm on the phone with the dean of the school, feeling the way that I felt in fifth grade Sunday school. I remember going into Sunday school and looking at the cool kids. The cool kids were the ones that had money and they had charisma and they were cute and they could read and they all wore this brand, LA gear. Now, you don't know nothing unless you know about LA gear, okay? Your life is incomplete unless you know about LA gear. And I would walk in, by the way, it's the 90s, don't judge me, okay? I would walk into Sunday school and see these kids and feel like, dang, if I get LA gear, I'm gonna be set. Then one <laughs> glorious day, something happened. My mom and I were shopping at a store called Pick and Save, which is now Big Lots, which is basically a ghetto version of Walmart. And I'm walking by myself down the clearance aisle and I see something that catches my eye. On the clearance rack, in my size, a white studded triple lace pair of Michael Jackson LA gear. I was like the heavens open and Michael the Archangel moonwalked down for me. I got those shoes and I ran to my mom and I said, mom, if you get me these shoes, I will never ask for anything else ever again. And she said I could get them. That day, I walked out of Big Lots with a white plastic bag and my MJ shoes like a baller. Like, yeah, church get hailing me now. I put on my kicks on Sunday morning and I walked into class and I saw the cool kids and I walked over kind of like, 
right, can I sit here? And they looked at me and they said, oh no, these, these seats are taken. So me and my AAA studded Michael Jackson shoes walked to an empty table by myself. The rejection from seminary that day revealed the same thing that I experienced in Sunday school. My greatest insecurity wasn't that there was enough room, but that I wasn't enough. I spent my whole life trying to shed the stigma of being too fat and too dumb and too brown and too poor and too much and not enough. And yet when it came to something like my faith, I was told that I couldn't be there, that I wasn't enough. The reason why I'm passionate about this parable is because Jesus invites everyone to sit with him. Let's read the text in context. Pick it up in verse 17. At the time when the banquet uh, he, at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all like, began to make excuses. For the first time, oh, the first said, I have just bought a field, so I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen. I'm on my, tra- on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly to the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. You know what I love about Jesus? Oh, Jesus loves a good party. Jesus loves to get turned up. Let me tell you, at Jesus' table, we are told, as I was studying for this message, there's this theologian that writes that in the book of Luke, specifically Luke, which is why I love Luke, is Luke loves a party and Jesus loves a party and Luke loved to document it. In the book of Luke, Jesus was always going to a party, coming from a party, or about to go to a party. So Jesus is sitting here, inviting anyone and everyone. Come sit with me. Come talk with me. I wanna know you. What's your name? What's your theology? What's your issue? Talk to me. Throughout the Gospels, we see various of characters and we see the heart of Jesus. The reason why the community that we live in now is unmoved by who we are or what we do is because we don't do what Jesus did. We like to talk about it. We like to read books about it. We like to theorize about it. We like to be real spiritual about it. Well, let me tell you what I think. Stop, no one cares. What does Jesus do, okay? At Jesus' table, he had Mary and Martha, a warrior and a worshiper, sit at his table. But it's more than they were just sitting there in the table. They were women who had audience with the teacher who we refer to as a rabbi. Women of this time were second-class citizens, non-entities. They had no intellectual capita. They had no political rights. They had no voting rights. They had no property rights. And Jesus says, I see you. One of them got to study under Jesus. That was Mary, who just loved Jesus so much. And Jesus allowed her to sit with her. I believe that there's women in here who might have grown up in a society, in a patriarchal home where you felt like You weren't allowed to have big kid conversations or even faith conversations because of your gender. You have a seat with Jesus. What about sitting here, a man that we know as Judas? Oh, Judas was a betrayer. Judas was savage. Judas sold Jesus for 20 shekels of silver. That's like common day amount of like 50 bucks. He sold Jesus out and Jesus tore bread and served him wine and said, you are mine. Go do what you have to do. Go do what you have to do. What about Simon the leper? I love Simon. I love that his name also includes like Simon the leper. That's like saying Bianca the Mexican because this was an identifier. Oh, by the way, I'm Mexican, okay? Mexican, Puerto Rican, we get the best of both worlds, yes. So here is Simon the leper. Mark and Matthew both talk about this man because it is important that his name is included because as a leper, he would have been not included in society. He would have exnayed. He couldn't hang out with people of faith. He definitely couldn't go to the church. And yet Jesus healed him and invited him and said, come have a seat with me. In the book of Luke alone, let me go through these as quickly as possible. Levi was basically an extortionist. He was a tax collector. He sat with a Hebrew scholar by the name of Simon the Pharisee. He sat with a no-name prostitute referred to as a woman who is sinful. Jesus fed anywhere from 10 to 20,000 with food that he just whipped up. My God is a party planner. 
Mary and Martha, he sat with women, religious officials, Sadducees and Pharisees, a corrupt tax official, basically white collar crime. His best friends and road dogs were hot mess express called the disciples. He had food with two hopeless men on the way to Emmaus and he sat and had food with the fearful people who were afraid after Jesus died. And people of that day who would have been labeled sinners, they loved Jesus. So why do people who we would determine, determine the sinners, not like us, Maybe because we've made them feel like they don't have a seat at the table. The disconnect of who Jesus was and who we are called to be is found here in this. And you know what? People saw that. People of the day in Jesus' time, they saw who he was hanging out with. They saw that he was rolling with. People of that time didn't accuse Jesus of being too theological. They didn't accuse Jesus of being too religious. They didn't accuse Jesus of coming in to fight in war. You know what they accused him of? Look at what Mark 7, 34. Don't turn there. It's up on the screen. The son of man came eating and drinking, and you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. They accuse Jesus of being a drunkard and a glutton. What's a drunkard? Someone who likes to get drunk, okay? Someone who's turned up all the time. What is a glutton? Someone who eats too much. But we as Americans, we don't understand that. <laughs> you want to know why? Because Americans spend $50 billion on dieting every year. At this point, right now, there are 20 men who are on a diet and 47% of women who are dieting. We spend more on curing our overconsumption than we do providing food for those that are actually hungry in this nation. But that wasn't Jesus. See, it wasn't just Jesus, it was also his disciples because people were like chirping, oh, your disciples, they should be praying and fasting and yet they're drinking and eating, oh, those heathen people. You wanna know what the mission strategy was for Jesus? Having dinner with people. You know when he spoke about theology and life and love and truth, he did evangelism and discipleship over fish, bread, and a pitcher of wine. And Jesus is called, if you look at that verse in Matthew 7, a, a drunkard and a glutton and a friend to sinners and tax collectors. The excessiveness of drinking and eating and the excessiveness of who he hung out with displays and demonstrates the excessiveness of God's grace for humanity. People are like, oh, that's so extra. Why you got to be so extra? Because I serve an extra God. Oh, Bianca, you always do the most. I do the most because I serve the most high God. Come on, somebody. The question is it, why do you do so much? The question is, why don't you do enough? Look at verse 21. Oh, I come to get turned tonight. Okay. <laughs> Go out quickly into the streets and the alleys. Verse 21 of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Why would this have been shocking then? Why would this have sucked the air out of the room at the dinner table where Jesus was? Because any good religious person, any good religious Jew would have known what our fathers taught us in the book of Leviticus. The lame the blind, the cripple, and the poor, they were not allowed in the temple. They were not allowed in a congregation like this. Why is this shocking now? Friends, we are the lame and the blind and the cripple and the poor. And you're sitting here thinking, oh, no, we are not. Really? I believe that we say in our nomenclature today as well, that's your truth, and this is my truth, and that's their truth. And we are nothing more than spiritually blind people because we're unable to see the truth of who God is. Here, here in our great nation, we nip, we tuck, we pluck, we freeze, we lift, we tighten. Why? Because we're spiritually lame. We are unable to see that God loves us just the way that we are and we can come to him with our ugliness. That we who have all that we have and, and we charge all that we want, are spiritually poor, unable to offer anything for our salvation. Thanks to Jesus, we don't have to be afraid of coming to him with our fear or our failure, our sin, our shame. You have a seat at the table. Look what Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. You know what I love? When we dine with Jesus, Jesus is the one that creates the meal. 
This is important to me because I had a great learning lesson. My husband was a missions pastor at Mariner's Church. We love that church in Newport Beach. And uh, we would host missionaries from across the world. And one time we were uh, asked to uh, host a pastor, a young pastor from Egypt. We were so excited and Matt came home and he said, B, I'd love to invite him to come into our house. Will you please make Mexican food? Matt loves when I make Mexican food. If I want my husband to love me, I just gotta make some salsa, okay? He told me, amen. Baby, I hear you. Don't wait, don't, oh, don't earn extra credit points tonight. So he said, hey, will you make Mexican food? I said, absolutely. I said, will you please ask him if he likes spicy food? Well, he said, yes. Yeah. So I turned up, all right? I made enchiladas with homemade red sauce, homemade rice and beans. I made salsa quemada, which is a roasted salsa. I threw down. I stuffed the enchilada with chicken and cheese and then rolled it, covered it with sauce, topped it with cheese, baked it. So when they arrived, I pulled it out like Susie Homemaker, but the brown version, cut it out, goopy cheese, because nothing says love like carbs and dairy, okay? I played it down and we were throwing down. It was all good until about 10 minutes in. Our Egyptian friend excused himself to the bathroom and stayed there for about 20 minutes. When he came out, he asked for a glass of milk and didn't eat anything else off of his plate. I found out later that he remained on the porcelain throne for the rest of the night and that pastor has yet to call us back. So Jesus doesn't care if we're a mess. He invites us in. He says, come to me. I want you to sit with me. I want to talk with you. Come sit at my table. Why is this important? Because a political or excuse me, a table invitation was a political or, re or religious alignment. Who you sat with is who you wanted to be. It was powerful. And people generally wanted to sit with people that were like them. They were in the same status as them. Nothing has changed. Kim and Kanye want to hang out with Jay-Z and Beyonce. Political pundits and political advisors want to hang out with their same political party. Nothing has changed. And what we see is that when you give an invite to those you want an invite back. That was the custom of that time, and dare I say it's the custom of today. So you would give poor food to poor people, but you'd ask the poor to go to the back so that they wouldn't come in. So even though growing up in my household, we didn't have a lot of money, my dad taught us at a very young age, this is not just something that I pontificate about, it's my ethos. My dad told us, you invite everyone and anyone to our house for dinner, I remember growing up in our small house and no matter how many seats we had, my dad always made room and space to invite others. We pulled up chairs for everyone and I remember vividly this one night, we had 16 people in our dining room and my dad made a gourmet meal of like Cheerios and baking soda. I mean, this guy was like a miracle worker. And to this day, if you go to my parents' house, you will always find tortillas and cheese and homemade salsa because nothing says salvation like quesadillas, okay? <laughs> nothing says that. This is the goodness right here. To this day, my best friends would come over and know that my dad is gonna serve them food, why? because my dad knew that meals were a mission field, that meals mattered. He was the first person to demonstrate food multiplication like Jesus. And people who were rejected by friends and family or confused about who they were or what they were doing, my dad invited them in and he taught us, welcome people up close so that love doesn't feel far. Our attitude towards those that are marginalized or ostracized should be shaped by experience of the grace that God has given us. There's something that happens when we sit at a table across from someone. We become equals. We look at them and we hear their stories. I remember being at the Los Angeles mission and uh, sitting across from a homeless woman and she said, I'm grateful for all the things that people have given me and done for me, but what I really want is for someone to listen to me and be my friend. People don't wanna be projects. People wanna be seen. We have the power of the life-giving word of God living within us, and the words that we speak can bring faith to people. I know that because I remember sitting across Gina Mitchell. She worked at our church, an African-American woman, chocolate brown skin, so beautiful, and she was married to Stan Mitchell, an architect, brilliant. Both of them were dynamic and powerful, and I looked at them and I said, one day I'm gonna be like Gina Mitchell. Gina Mitchell invited me to the mall with her. She actually picked me up from our apartment on Bedillo Boulevard and took me to the West Covina Mall and she 
bought me a turtleneck with floral print and I thought like I was so G. What made me think I was gangster with the turtleneck? I don't know, I was young. And then she took me to AW Root Beer and we had, we split a root beer and fries and she looked at me and she said, Bianca, one day you are gonna go to college. One day people are gonna look at you and think if she got out of the hood, I can get out of the hood. One day God is gonna use you and your story and your voice. And for the first time across from Gina, I thought, I am a child of God. Did she open up the Bible? Did she quote theology or give me some reference on what some theologian said? No, she spoke life. So I believe that people need a sense of community. And what I offer to you is that we have the best community through Jesus Christ. So how do we do this? How do we open up our doors? How do we make people feel welcomed? Number one, if you're taking note, say yes to hosting or having a meal with someone. All you have to do is have a meal and share your story. It's not that meals save people, but the conversations that happen are open opportunities for us to display the goodness of God. Number two, pull up a chair. Be willing to engage in a card conversation. Be willing to disagree. Be willing to show up because what you put in is what you get out. Don't give up at those conversations. You never know where you're gonna find your community. And lastly, this empty seat here was left intentionally because once we have a seat at the table, we have to recognize that we make a seat for someone else. This is not the holy huddle, us four and no more. We've made it, thank God, we'll be in the heaven after the rapture. That there are people that are crying out and saying, do I matter? Who is this God that you serve? Can you tell me that there's hope for me? Once you have a seat at the table, make room because there's a banquet waiting for God to have with you. How do we know this? Isaiah prophesied it. Isaiah 25, 6 says, the Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all his people on this mountain, a banquet with aged wine, choice pieces of marrow, that's meat, that's so good, and aged, refined wine. Jesus, when he sat with people, he sang, I am the banquet. I am the party. I am here and I have welcomed you. So you and you and you, you have a seat at the table. Here at TFHOC, you absolutely do, but I need you to hear whether you come back or not. God is waiting for you to come, pull up a chair and then pull out a chair. He wants to see you and recognize you and believe that there's, that there's good yet to come. So you who have no money whatsoever, college student, you are welcome to have a seat at the table. You, business owner, entrepreneur, money bags with zero relational collateral, you have a seat at the table. You who have loans and debts, you have a seat at the table. You who have all the money in the world and no one to enjoy that life with, look at what Isaiah 55, one through two says. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy eat come buy wine and milk without money and without cost why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance as the band begins to sing over us this is your opportunity to respond here at tfhoc we believe that god is going to do something big in our community we believe that the vision that god has given us outmatches our resources but that's not gonna stop us. It outmatches the people that are here. That ain't gonna stop us. We are preparing those empty seats in the back with seat covers and tablecloths because we believe that there are people out there that are spiritually hungry, spiritually thirsty, that are saying, do I matter? Do I have a place? And guess what? If you have a seat at the table, now's your opportunity to create and pull out a seat for someone else.